そうですねきっかけは何だったんだろうマサアキ・ユアサは、オーターは、何を知っていますか From his stark visual flair to the stories he tells with that powerful palette, his work carries a different sort of weight to the competition. A lot of anime directors find success by understanding the limitations of themselves, their team, and the medium at large. Masaki Yuasa excels because he believes these limitations simply don't exist. Watch anything the man has ever touched, and you might find yourself agreeing with that bold statement. で読んだけど本当靴下の色が何色か線が何本入ってるのかってそんなの本当はどうでもいいと思ってるんだけどいや青の靴下で赤は一本にしてくれっていうことでなんか世界ができていくみたいななんかそういう職業なんだろうなと思ってますね。He's known for the numerous standout award-winning works he's directed, but Yuasa is intimately familiar with every part of the animation process. Having a hand not only in the direction, but in the script writing, storyboarding, and even key animation, Yuasa ensures that every one of his movies is his movie, and the results speak for themselves. His portfolio is instantly recognizable, and it's thanks to this hands on attitude throughout the entire production. Even if you haven't heard his name before, you've probably seen something of Yuasa's without even realizing it. Let's hit the snack bar and eat something yummy. From his eye popping key animation in Samurai Champloo and My Neighbors the Amateurs, to his guest spots directing episodes of Space Dandy and even Adventure Time, you're likely to have stumbled across his energetic visuals before. Through his ineffable style, Yuasa channels an energy that is wholly unique. His distinctive, initially simplistic line art belies a depth that allows even his television shows to breathe life into every frame thanks to fluid animation and lively expressions. Televised anime is, almost by definition, A visual compromise. It was born out of the necessity to cut costs and consequently cut corners. Static backgrounds and low frame counts with limited character animation allowed studios to put out regular content, and even modern anime, which is often still produced week to week as the show airs, adheres to these foundations. Masaki Yuasa, on the other hand, never seemed to get the memo. His characters feel like a genuine cast, thanks in a large part to their smart design, their unique expressions, and the fact that they're constantly in motion. There's this moment in anime known as Sakuga, where the animation is turned up to 11 so that the scene can feel more impactful. This bump in quality is usually lavished on complicated action set pieces, but for Yuasa, who made his name animating these moments for other shows, they simply don't exist. Sakuga isn't necessary when your episode to episode animation looks this fluid. Yuasa is known for his frenetic, constantly moving images, where nothing stays still on the screen for long. Whether it's down to his rapid fire editing or his delightful and surprising animation, everything flows. An early work of his, Kaiba, is a prime example of a show that seems to just ooze thanks to this bulbous Osama Tezuka inspired character design and its constantly flowing movement. Whilst Yuasa has had something of a Midas touch from early on in his career, it feels like only now is he truly hitting his stride. In the last year, he has released a season of anime and two feature length films, a wild accomplishment, especially considering they're all spectacular. Yuasa has had a reputation for creating critically adored films that don't make much of a splash commercially. Despite raking in awards and building a stunning portfolio of work, I imagine Yuasa often had trouble greenlighting future projects. After all, these studios are ultimately in it for the money, and these types of movies, as fantastic as they are, don't tend to do that. In Anime World Network's article on Yuasa, they state that his opus, Mind Game, was a critical success but a box office failure, so much so that very few producers would even touch Yuasa after that. Even Yuasa admits, I always enjoy making films, but I must confess that I'd like to find more supporters and sympathizers and to make a commercial success. I really want to catch up with what people really want. 
In his 15 years directing projects, he courted numerous studios until he struck out on his own, testing the waters with the first ever kick-started anime film in 2013, titled Kick Heart. <laughs> Following this success, he set up his own production company, Science Saru, a year later. What we've seen in the last year is the first fruit that that studio has bought, three years after inception, and they're all absolute knockouts. I think this recent work acts as a fantastic and varied starting point to your relationship with this visionary. Today on Beyond Ghibli, we'll be looking at the last 12 months of Masaaki Yuasa. First up is the nicest short, Walk On Girl, an absolutely beautiful adaptation of a novel by Tomohiko Morimi. The Night is Short chronicles a surprisingly long night of a young university student as she acquaints herself with buckets of beautifully illustrated alcohol and the eccentric oddballs of Kyoto's nightlife. She's a relentlessly optimistic person and this demeanour helps make the film a hugely positive one. Elsewhere, another student attempts to coincidentally bump into our leading lady until she believes they're fated to be together and we follow his comic struggles to impress her with an admirable determination. Sliced neatly into four distinct parts, including a killer musical act. The Night is Short feels paradoxically endless in its 90 minute run, oftentimes feeling more like binging four episodes of the most beautiful anime you've ever seen than a movie. But the film admirably ties it all together by the end and presents a stunning and satisfying united front. Yuasa also adapted an earlier work of Marimi's called The Tatami Galaxy for an 11 episode show that garnered massive praise. And if you've been a fan of televised anime for any length of time, you'll have either seen it already or had someone yelling at you to watch it for years. Allow me to join that chorus and tell you, Tatami Galaxy is a must watch. Tatami and The Night is Short share a sharp visual style, the Kyoto locale and some key characters and themes. And to enjoy and understand the movie fully, I would recommend checking out the series first. Keep your eyes peeled as the show's excellent dialogue is delivered lightning fast, and without an English dub you might struggle initially to keep up. But once you fall into the frenetic rhythm, you'll soon learn to love that very pacing. The Tatami Galaxy has got a time loop premise that I've admitted before is one of my favourite narrative hooks, and it uses that to create some of the most satisfying storytelling I've encountered in anime to date by the end of which you'll be desperate to eat a Costello. There's a tease in one of the later episodes, where a character gives their friend a copy of Marimi's novel The Night Is Short, and though I'm not sure Yuasa had any idea he'd ever be making this movie some six years later, it's a great moment that sets up everything to come. The Night Is Short feels like a wonderful reprise, a well-deserved victory lap, not only for a lot of the characters we loved in the show, but for Yuasa's masterful dedication to his craft. Developed at the same time and released just one month after The Night Is Short, Yuasa's next project showed that Science Saru meant business, and I mean that quite literally. Yuake Tsuguru Luna Uta, known as Lu Over the Wall in the West, is Yuasa's first easily marketable film that seems to be chasing commercial success. A story of a boy befriending a mermaid with music, much to the chagrin of his mermaid-hating hometown and music-hating grandfather, is family-friendly fare that was sure to attract the Ghibli audience. Indeed, it even has strong parallels to Ponyo, though the films ended up being very different. Watching it, I felt I was seeing a new side to Yuasa, an innocence and perhaps vulnerability he hadn't shown on film before. The nihilistic streak of rambled introspections of Tatami Galaxy was gone, replaced instead with a musical beat that forces people to dance against their will. A bright, almost too bright colour palette, and a narrative energy to finally match Yuasa's visual style. But behind all of the optimism and the mainstream appeal was Yuasa's weirdness and an electric eye for motion. As our protagonist Kai attempts to hide his new mermaid friend from hyper-suspicious townsfolk, reminiscent of Spielberg's E.T., we're treated to a beat that underpins the entire movie. There's a musicality at the heart of the proceedings that is infectious. Much like characters in the film, I simply couldn't stop tapping my feet along every time someone picked up a guitar, and it's a key story point as well, 
as every time the band kicks up, Lou's tail becomes a pair of dancing feet. It's telling that Yuasa focused on a wider demographic right after setting up his own company. Now the bills were landing at his door, it seemed he had to take responsibility for passion projects such as The Night Is Short. I was a little concerned initially, but after watching Lou over the wall, I can safely say it's one of my favourite things he's done. The pessimistic view I had going in, that he was selling out to balance his books, was way off. In fact, Lou Over the Wall feels more like a Yuasa piece than anything that's come before, from a style that flirts with early Disney animation and abrupt slapstick comedy, to a story that, despite its positive and upbeat tone, dips its toes in ugly human emotion before rising above it all to show us that we can be better. It's a surprise tearjerker, a visual spectacle, and one that no one should overlook. This next section contains some pretty graphic imagery. If that isn't for you, feel free to skip ahead to the conclusion using the jump in the description below. By all means, Yuasa should have been taking a break after releasing two movies in the same year. That's a mega accomplishment for any director, but he was far from done. On the 5th of January, Whilst I was making my way through his portfolio for this video, he launched a Netflix original series called Devilman Crybaby, with very little fanfare. It was completely different to Night is Short and Lou in terms of its visual style, storytelling and target audience, and it's done brilliantly with critics and viewers alike. Devilman Crybaby is actually a reboot of the Devilman series, a popular manga and anime run from the 70s. The original anime adaptation isn't quite as violent or as bleak as the manga, and Crybaby seeks to rectify that perceived injustice. At times it provides a shot-for-shot -shot translation of Go Nagai's work, and it delivers body horror hyperviolence and rampant sex in equal measure, with the two mixing unsettlingly throughout a series that seems to run solely on the adrenaline of its own visceral thrills. From the orgy-turned bloodbath in its opening act, to a fascinating finale, Devilman Crybaby bets the farm on the fact that you simply won't be able to look away, and for the most part it's absolutely right. Despite a ludicrously high body count, Crybaby doesn't feel like it's desperately stretching for an adult audience. It earns its mature rating not as a goal, but as a byproduct of its own art. Yasa finds rhythmic beauty in people getting torn to shreds. It sets out to shock, of course, and it achieves that with some truly toe-curling moments, but it's in service of that pulse-pounding pace that drives the show, something that forces the viewer to sit up and pay attention, a blasé attitude towards destruction that the show simply wouldn't work without. I often hear people say that Yasa's visual style doesn't click with them. In fact, they're a turn-off, and I would say to them, stick with it. His divisive aesthetics have a habit of winning people over in the long run. Devilman Crybaby, however, is the exception. If you don't like the first couple of episodes, you're probably safe to find something else to watch. It shows its hand very early on, an unrelenting, horny, gory world where no one gets what they deserve. It's filled with wicked characters and rip and tear action set pieces, and I couldn't help but fall for its claret stained spectacle. Much like its many scenes of relay racing during its brief 10 episode run, Devilman Crybaby simply passes a blood soaked baton from episode to episode in a string of mad sprints to a climactic finish line. This isn't everything Yuasa has to offer, of course, and it's far from the last we'll hear from him and Science Saru as he continues to explore anime and what that term even means. Yuasa makes provocative art, art that continues to push the preconceived boundaries of the medium, and it's fascinating to watch him work. His diverse portfolio has such wide-reaching appeal, from mermaid idols to ping-pong superstars and sadistic nuns, there's likely something in there you'll fall in love with. And I guarantee you, once you're in, you're in. Once you've attuned yourself to Masaaki Yuasa's mad energy, you'll be hard-pressed to find satisfaction anywhere else than at the end of his imagination. As always, thanks for watching. I can't stress enough that everything Yuasa has ever made is well worth checking out, and I've had a blast making my way through his library of works for this video. Despite taking three weeks, this is actually one of my more timely releases, and I'm hoping to keep up the pace for my next project. 
It's something completely different and I'm really excited about it. If you want to know more about that and how it's coming along, you can follow me on Twitter or subscribe to get notified of when it lands. If you think I should actually slow my pace to the point where, you know, I never upload anything ever again, hit the like button and I'll get really into Monster Hunter.